And we're back and we are moving into our second conversation for today. We are joined by Richard Dickey Bradley, attorney, but of course uh, just uh, a history enthusiast. That's what we'll call you this morning. And uh, we are talking about Emancipation Day and slavery in the Caribbean. Good morning, Good morning. and welcome. Good morning, gentlemen and ladies. Now I should be lady and gentlemen. And, and to your viewers. Um, well, okay, I think that most of your viewers do not know that on the 1st of August in 1838 that slavery legally came to an end in Belize as it did everywhere the British were in control of people and their lands. Actually, I wanted to start there. Yes. Because I think that those of us who have friends or have had experiences in other Caribbean countries, we know that they do celebrate. Um, it's actually a, a festive day. There's some kind of celebration geared towards acknowledging Emancipation Day. Why is it that we never did adopt that practice in Belize? Well, first of all, we are not as homogeneous as the Caribbean countries. If you look at Barbados, mm. they're all Barbadians. Um, we are not only uh, mixed culture, mixed ethnic groups here, but in fact, the children of Africa have been overtaken in terms of population-wise. We're waiting very impatiently on the new census to see what kind of percentage we are in what used to be our country. So that is probably one reason, but I think a deeper reason is that when slavery came to an end, the British and the other European countries um, were still in control of the peoples and their countries in the region and elsewhere. And so under a long period of colonialism, mm -hmm. um, they were skillful enough to make us feel comfortable to keep a far distance from the African roots, no? Yeah. There was a movie house in Belize City called, they call it Palace Theater. It mm -hmm. was really a cinema. Mm -hmm. But, you know, one of the big heroes of the movie era was a guy from out of a book called Tarzan. Mm -hmm. It's an incredible thing because there we all are cheering for Tarzan, who just happened to have gotten into Africa by way of a plane crash. And so this little European baby, more than likely, I think Edgar Rice Burroughs was probably an English writer. And that little baby grew up in Africa, but he could terrorize the Africans. He could call lions and tigers and elephants and crocodiles after the natives who <laughs> for thousands of years lived with these animals. Um, it's a... Are you saying that it's a bit of conditioning? It's it's the not a bit. It's a major. It's a major piece of conditioning. Because we take take the situation with the Garinago people and the Creoles in in Belize. Um, the British made sure that they were suspicious of each other, mm -hmm. to the extent that they in fact feared each other, and were suspicious of each other. And one of the books that is extremely helpful in helping us to understand um, O. Nigel Boland's book, which I had to turn back to bring, The Formation of a Colonial Society, Belize from Conquest to Crown Colony. He points out a matter. I'm glad you started there because up until, if my, up until 1750, the slaves were hanging on to hanging on to their connection mm -hmm. um, with, their, with their names. And it's, he, he made the observation, of course, because there was Congos, Mandingos, Mongos, Ashantes, Coromontes. There would have been a wide variety of tribes mm -hmm. from Western Africa and we talk about Africa as if it's a country, but it's really a continent with what are now 53, 53 different states. And they, they were able to, even at that stage, keep the tribes them suspicious of one another. Mm -hmm. 
which Marlene may explain why to the day the children of those tribes still remain suspicious of one another. Since, uh, let me start at the beginning in terms of the record. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A Spanish missionary passed through what is now Belize, at least Belize City, and observed in 1724 that there were a number of white people, there were some mosquito Indians, and that there were Negroes, that is as far back as we can determine the appearance of Africans on our little portion of the mainland. In fact, Belize wasn't really um, mentioned in terms of, say, people coming here until the late 1600s when the buccaneers and the pirates um, wanted to hide from the ships that were hunting them down and eventually came across the Lagood, which turned out to be the equivalent of maybe cocaine because it was a very valuable resource to dye clothes in Europe. So black people turned up, Africans started turning up in 1724. I think by 1745, there were um, several hundred white persons and a goodly amount of, of they call Negroes and Negresses. And then we have a portion of our history which I didn't know anything about. But in 1779, the Spaniards, as part of the treaty where Spain had given Britain permission to cut Lagood mm -hmm. and not to build any fortifications, not to have any sugar plantations, mm -hmm. no coffee plantations, a whole lot of things that they are not to do, they would come and check and see what was happening here. And in 1779, on the 15th of September, the Spaniards landed at St. George's Key. Broke up everything, and they took away 101 white people, 40 colored people, and 200 to 250 Negroes. That is on the record. So we know in 1779 what kind of population was on what would have been the closest thing to a capital. Mm -hmm for Belize City, because, in fact, I brought a map which I want to show. I don't know if Stephanie, I had left it with yeah. Stephanie. She that's, does? That's the selection that you're talking about. Um, right? No, there's actually a map, if it had come out yeah. good enough. I marked it on there the... It yeah. Okay, that is an excellent piece of our history, mm -hmm. because, because that is St. George's Key, which is just 10 miles in front of Central Bank. Where we go to get it, we're up on the road, so we come through. Um, a little more distance, but mm -hmm. uh, uh -huh. all those little markings, those little rectangulars and squares and so on, are the houses of persons who, on the left side, bottom column, all their names of the families who had um, residences out at St. George's Key. And I think the top of that map shows, shows the date. That was 1764. 1764. We have an idea what was happening out there at St. George's Key. We have the names of the people who lived there. Mrs. Maud, Miss Gill, Mr. Dosil, the warehouses of Mr. Gill, Mr. Kame or Kame, um, somebody named Gill, Captain Toll, and on and on. But what is interesting for our discussion is that all of those things are numbered. And number 20 the are the Negro quarters. quarters. Mm -hmm. And number 21 is the gallows, the famous gallows. That is where they would hang you in public to make an um, example to others not to mess around. So it is interesting because St. George's Key is a big part of that old history, and I say history, but it's really his story, mm -hmm. because it's, of course, the, the slaves couldn't read or write or leave behind anything. So we do know that at that time, at that time there were 200 to 250 um, Negroes who were out there. If you look on the, on the shore to the northern, northeastern part, you see turtle corral. Yeah, to There's the a lot. There. We used to export turtle. And among the jobs that the slaves had, some of them were master turtlers. Mean like then I go catch the big turtle and get them ready for where the thing is. Um, the other thing about the 18th century, 17 something, mm -hmm. is that in 1787, 
So uh, let me just let me just finish on that point. St. George's key is important because of 1779 and of course 1798, which is the so-called Rome Battle of St. George's key. Mm -hmm. um, uh, in a short while after that, in 1787, the British had to give up their other settlement in Nicaragua. Mm -hmm. Spain insisted that they would allow them to stay on Cotla Good, no fortifications and so on, but they had to give up the other one in Nicaragua, which was on the Mosquito Coast. So the, in the, the inhabitants, the population that the British controlled on that small settlement were all brought to Belize. 2,200 and odd person came of, came, of which three quarter of them were in fact slaves. Mm -hmm. And a goodly portion of the Mosquito Indians came with their British friends and masters. And up to, to this day, if you ask in the area like say Unitedville, Black Man Eddy, and the villages on the west, mm -hmm. they can still tell you, oh yes, Mr. Dickie, some Waika used to live this place, sir, but we hardly they hardly got the generation wrong because I think, I'm not, I don't want to go anywhere. I think who we call the Waika are the Mosquito Indians mm -hmm. who came over and they had big problem because the Bayman wanted to enslave them and they were saying, where we come from, we don't have a slave, you know, they that timing. Mm -hmm. So, but that increased the population, I believe, which gave it a little chance to grow. It's a very small I, yeah. population. I just wanted to, um, you know, on the point of, you know, emanci uh, Emancipation Day and, and going back to kind of what Marlene said a bit earlier about conditioning. When it comes to conversations about slavery in Belize, the few that we do have, mm -hmm. I should say, maybe I, maybe I should start there by asking wh why, by, by starting off by saying, why is it a conversation that, that, that isn't very often had as much as we do have in the rest of the Caribbean, but also when we do have it, there has been a view expressed, which you, that, which you may have heard or probably have heard that Slavery in Belize was not as bad as in the oh, rest different. of the Caribbean because yeah. we didn't have the plantation system and they were just out in the wood cutting and therefore it was not as brutal. There, there is a lot of truth to that. Mm -hmm. The slavery that we know occurred in the so-called New World, um, the Caribbean, South America, and especially United States of America, which is convulsing right now, especially because of the treatment that black people are going through over there. You are correct. The historians, at least the books I have read, they all make that comparison. And it makes sense in the sense that to go to cut Lagood and then especially the mahogany trees, these large trees which were 17 feet in diameter. Um, the slaves had to have axes. They also had to have some kind of muskets because then you lived off the land and they would have been good to catch game meat and things of that nature. Mm -hmm. And then you don't want to whop up somebody that tongue and then next week you're out in the bush. At some stage you drop asleep and you wake up with, you know, the man got a knife yeah. <laughs> on your neck. So there is truth in that. And if we have an idea of plantation slavery, plantation slavery also required a number of black people. Slaves soon would have been broken in and turned into Uncle Tom. And, you know, I, I won't have the time, but at some stage we'll get a chance to see what um, Malcolm X said about the field slaves and the house slaves. The people who oversaw the slaves working in the plantations, even though, you know, they, they had to be brutal. Mm -hmm. In fact, the record in the record in Belize is that the the brown skin well, not even the brown skin woman then, but the woman who started having children for slave masters, and who would have been brought into the house as domestics and so on, um, they too were very harsh and very cruel to to the to the. Uh, uh, the to no. the slaves, the slave women in particular. What, what I hear from you is is that there was a building of uh, a hierarchy within the slaves, within the community of slaves themselves, from those who perhaps had more access to those who had more power and to those who were executing the work. That, that is so. And that is in any situation, whether it's the Roman Empire enslaving other mm -hmm. peoples. And you would have to have that. You have to have persons who are kind of go-between. Because remember now also, 
um, even though there was this suspicion between members of one tribe and members of another tribe, and that mm -hmm. suspicion would have been fed and encouraged by the slave master. Mm -hmm. Why not listen to the Zulu cross there? Because then the mm -hmm. plan for the thing, not listen to the... Yeah. Um, you'd have to have that hierarchy. Mm -hmm. And if you're soft and you can't handle the job out with you, and there's always somebody who is willing to whap them slaves there and bring mm -hmm. them in line, that is just... That is just human nature. I mean, Jesus picked some people and they let him down bad. Mm -hmm. Or some I mean, didn't let him down. No? Even though they promised that I would have never, never deny you, Jesus. Never, mm -hmm. my boy. I'll never do a thing like that. But <laughs> All right, so let me just get this yeah. here before you um, throw your question at me. Mm -hmm. There were two census in 1790. The second census showed that there were 261 white persons in Belize. There were 371 free colored people. Yeah. And there were 2,024 slaves. Okay. They didn't count the Mayas. The books tell us that for about 30 years, the Mayas conducted a running battle with the Bayman, with the white British uh, masters, them, trying to keep them out of their jungle because you know they are penetrating deeper to cut the, the wood and so on. So up to at least 1719, there is no record of how many Mayas were involved, but it does show that the British were fearful of the Maya Indians and complained regularly about how these people will eventually overrun them and so on and so forth. There are documents, there are letters yeah. that show that, right? That is yeah. true. Those are written documents complaining yeah. on a regular basis. Yeah. Likewise, since I'm on, I'm on that, let me also throw this in. Throughout the history of slavery in Belize, the the white power structure were writing to Jamaica, were writing to their superiors, complaining bitterly that Guatemala and especially Mexico, um, the, the, the countries around us, they freed slaves from like long before the British did. I think from maybe 1820 they had officially released slaves. But before that, slaves could run away and, and be accepted. They were encouraged to run away from the British so as not to have a settlement develop into a kind of little Community. town. Yes. Yeah. So that was an, 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 an ongoing thing. And in fact, in one of the big slave rebellions, um, some of the rebels were able to travel over 100 miles from here to reach a Mexican border where they would be accepted and freed. And let me also throw this in, since it turned up in more than one of the records, that 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 um that thing in 1779 when the spanish came and wiped off St. George's key population there were some there were almost about five or six people hiding in our dory but later they reported that some of the black people who were on the island with the spaniards were some runaway slaves from belize they recognized <laughs> them no so, so the population of Belize in terms of slave, there was a huge amount of black compared to the whites. Mm -hmm. In relation to white people, white men were four to one to white women. In a situation like that, the record shows, and the historians, they refer to it, that of course you have a lot of men wrong the place and leave it a woman. Their attention is drawn to all these powerful, sexy, Beyonce-type women who they knock both. They call them Boxon, meaning like, yeah. They got like Kim Kardashian type of body. Um, not everybody, of course. There would be some people who... But you know that um, I wanted to say this, and I'm glad you went there, Courtney, because in Belize, there are two things. The Creole people are indigenous to Belize because it is white people who are here having sex with black people who were here, the white masters and the black slaves. Um, in fact, you could just look at what happened on St. George's Key. Out of, um, and by the way, I want to give credit to Fred Hunter. Mm -hmm. He has written a book about the situation with Belize and Guatemala and Britain, but he produced a lot of records and a lot of information. So big respect. Um, but the record would show that some Creoles were brought from the Caribbean. They use the word the West Indies, but as we now know, Columbus thought he had reached yeah. the front of India. Yeah. And he said, well, these are the Indies. Indians, yeah. But <coughs> we're not 
Well, whatever it you is. You were given yeah. that title, yeah. Yeah. yeah that yeah. name. Um, so, so you were you were moving towards the point of of, of people the who are indigenous. But before we get there, because I think one of the clear distinctions that has to be made, which has a unique history in itself, is looking at the free people of color, mm -hmm. um, how they came to to be established as such, and how what role they played in being able to advocate or not advocate. Um, for uh, the the emancipation of the slaves, they were they were colored yeah. people as well. Yeah, colored is the word that the white people used to yes. describe them. Um, you would have two. Th well, let me finish the point that you raised, which is important for me. Mm -hmm. Is that some Creoles were brought from the Caribbean, mm -hmm. um, but the vast majority of Creoles grew up and come out of Belize because of that connection between the white people and the black slave woman. It can't be the other way around. No black man can go breed no white woman. That the death on the spot. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, I can't help myself, so I'm going to say this part that I think it is Malcolm X who made the point that in the United, southern part of the United States of America, um, it was against the law and black man they look upon white people close upon the line. Mm. In fact, where they look upon people close by, you must have tried to help <laughs> something out of the way. Um, so, so strict they were, no? Mm -hmm. But they were not strict with, with white men getting black women pregnant. And so you would then have this, this in, in a sense, it's a wonderful thing in terms of history that a whole nother people come to be in Belize, I mean, <coughs> I'm sorry to say that, you know, they have lost it. We don't know if they'll go the way of the Waika Indians and the East Indians in our midst, but um, that is an important question, Marlene. I know we won't have the time to deal with it, but I could just skim and tell you that the colored people that started, grew up, started going up in this place were getting a better treatment than the black people because then they are the children of the masters. And in fact, in Belize, in Belize, slaves could easily obtain their freedom. Your master can give you your freedom. You can put it in writing. You can, and a lot of them did, the slaves could work and so find some kind of way to buy their freedom from their masters. And it wasn't very, very expensive. Um, and of course, a man they beat up a, a monk, a woman, and got picked. Now when he's dying, he put in his will, he, he would leave a record and say that they're all free. So you have these people who are growing up. In fact, there's an interesting case, Joshua Jones. Joshua Jones was a free colored. And he had, he had 17 slaves. But he must have been like, one of them begging to bar because he didn't get himself in and one big trouble. He's reported in the records as, um, like, he rung up on a monk, a colored person like himself, and they locked him up because he broke down one of the white masters who was a magistrate. He broke down their cook house. You know, your little house would be here, and for fire purposes, you do your cooking a distance That's away in a cook good. house. Um, he broke down the magistrate cook house. He must be like Nigel Petio or maybe Giovanni Bracchetti. He big. They grab him and lock him up. But the free colors, they go and get musket and machete and say that they want free. Huh? So there was a big standoff between the white people and the free colored. And a couple of the slaves, but the majority of slaves did not side in, meaning that they left them Creole, make them battle in one thing, you know, they encourage them, because they know they look out for we. Mm -hmm. It's an interesting thing, the Joshua Jones story is given um, about two pages in Nigel Boland's book, and it's worth a research and so, because the records are available, this is a good thing with those matters. Um, also, to answer your question too, in the early stages, clearly they are not white. Clearly, they are called colored because they don't all have one color. Mm -hmm. <coughs> some of them must look like people from Crooked Tree. Some would have looked like, you know, more brown. Some of them would be dark. It's a whole kaleidoscope of colors in terms of black, gray, blacker, more blacker, and so on. 
And I know when I was going to primary school, they called several people Kalad. Kalad, come inside them. You know, I didn't know it was a, because we don't want to say black in Belize, it's a curse word. Um, you know, I have to make mention of this, that everybody else come to Fui country, or what used to be our country, and they make progress, and for some reasons, we remain at the bottom of the ladder. I think when I was looking at what is happening, you notice that CNN, CNN stop show Black Lives Matter protests and riot in, in America and then the focus on the COVID, but that thing is still bubbling and it's still, yeah. uh, that yeah. thing, I'm a major thing because the, the television images, there are a lot of white people who have seen the injustices in the United States and are supporting what is going on with those, with those persons. But then that, that, well, I was gonna say that that kind of goes back to your original, well, the, one of the first points that you made is that history is about his story and who is getting to control mm -hmm. the, um, narrative about what what and what conversations people have that is good. and i think you know also going back to something that we were discussing earlier about the conditions of slavery in belize and you compared to the rest of the caribbean and whatever i still think though that regardless of what the conditions were inherent in the system is maintaining it by brutality by force and we know that there have been, there were instances, one of the famous ones was um, Thomas Paslow, who they were... Um, infamous. <laughs> infamous, I should say. <laughs> yeah. One of the most brutal uh, masters. Um, and it's not really a conversation that we really have that often when we discuss slavery in Belize, what they act how they maintain the power through those means. And we also don't talk about the fact that there were rebellions against it. And, yeah. you, well, and, and as you brought up, yes. even the Joshua Jones incident is not one that's, that's no, known. No, it's not unique. In fact, there are two, the records are interesting because a lot of the, not a lot, but a number of cruelty towards women mm -hmm. were done by other women um, because they are trying to keep away the competition. You know, I, I managed, I had to sleep with the master, you know, I come the, the, the bones up your body around the place. In fact, no come in at the house. No make a catch you, the child come in at the house, you know. Um, and then the other part, which of course is a natural part of slavery, where in order to control people, no care how docile, by the way, there's no record of slave ships coming to Belize from Africa. Mm -hmm. They would go to the warehouse of the British, which would be Jamaica. One of the most dynamic countries. Every Belizean should, 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 should see Jamaica. Um, and then they would get people who already were the car. They don't broke them in. They don't season them. They don't got the understanding. You can't escape because you can't get on no ship and go back to Africa. You can't you get in a trouble. I'll come to the slave rebellions in Belize because there is an important point I would want to make out of it in relation to that matter. But the record is... I, won't, I, don't, I, won't, I won't say it's filled, but there is sufficient information and the brutality of, I mean, that's slavery, right? Mm -hmm. So s they have, you know, recently they have come across some of the Bibles that the white people in America have gone through the Bible and take out all the references to how God may call away where all his children and all of that, so that yes. they could maintain that system of control. Mm -hmm. And yes, in Belize, they were cruel men. Um, look at this. In 1817, a slave woman was found guilty by the court. Guess what after she crime? Insolence and bad conduct. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine? She was found guilty, Marlene, and she was insolent to her mistress. The court sentenced her to 100 lashes on her bare back and also was ordered to be dragged around the tongue at the tail of a cart. A hundred lashes to the open your mouth. Mm -hmm. You think that is bad? That same year, another cut, slave cut. for stealing. Cut, yeah. Yes. Another slave for stealing mm -hmm. was sentenced by the court to 250 lashes and to be dragged around the tongue after the lashes. How can you inflict 250 lashes on a human being? I mean, this is, this is part of, of the story that, that usually, um, well, I, I think it's, if we look at the level of knowledge that we as Belizeans have 
about the history of slavery in Belize, I venture to say that a lot of what you have presented, and we have, we've had this conversation before, is new. For some reason, we have never looked at being able to uh, acknowledge that there was slavery in Belize, how it has impacted the structure that we have in place today. Um, and, and as much as we are moving or soon to get to our, to our uh, completing a 40th decade, we, we still don't seem to be moving towards including these important parts of our history in the education of our people. Well, I have, I think you and I have gone down that road in a slightly different angle. But I would, <coughs> excuse me, I would cry shame on the University of the West Indies branch in Belize. Because I know when I was going to university in Jamaica, they made a bubble. And that was in the 1980s. You could go to these big lecture halls and you could hear, you know, whoever it is on a wide variety of relevant topics and issues. Mm -hmm. University of Belize branch in Belize, dead. Worse than Lazarus, can't come out of the grave. They're just dead as to the University of Belize who for we tax money got it. It's just shameful that there is no kind of intellectual, no kind of academic, no kind of historical discussion on things that are important to us. And likewise, I don't know what is happening in Galen because it's far away and if, of course it is tiny. But listen, these are the institutions, not only them, me and you two who have only education, have a duty to stop the free brother and sister and tell her, why you go on ignorant, my boy? You could do better than that. Not if follow them man there and go get no gun and shoot nobody because you the quarrel. Quarrel for what? We're going to kill you the guns like an ignorant slave and so. Mm -hmm. We need to talk to our people, but I, we don't have that culture. We just don't have that culture. The local radio and local television shy away. There are people who are writing poetry. There are artists in our midst and so. Now and then they get one a couple of seconds. But in terms of educating our population, I don't know if maybe like say, well, I don't want to use me as an example because I literally born from outside. I never gone to the hospital. My mother come in from Half Moon Key and I born a midwife. And so I think, well, maybe I'm biased. Maybe I am biased. I couldn't use myself as no kind of example for several. If I could do it, or no could do it because that is not fair. Because I know when I go to school and I say, Ma, you know, Ma, the kind of school barefoot, you know, they put them in. Darling, sometimes people have things hard, yeah? Mm -hmm. I probably told you the story, I didn't. Possibly. We get a box from states. And one lady named Maud Garma, I call her name because I wish somebody, you know enough to call no name. <laughs> 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 I wish somebody would try and tell me who was that lady. I was a primary school child. And a box came from New Orleans. And I remembered her name because at the first time now, I am getting shoes from states. And why? Everybody got a little thing, got a little shirt, got a name, decay. I got my shoes, man. I only love my shoes. When I turn over the shoes, it's too so of a big hole. And then I grew up with a man who was a lighthouse keeper who did not show nothing, not believe in a waste. And so, so he, he sliced off the edge of what we call Mali, whether mm -hmm. it be a Congolum or a Kondo, whatever it is. And he cut it the the shoes thing underneath and he put it on and, and I gone to school with that till then could have gotten, yeah. Mm -hmm. So but I say that because you know the funny thing, right? Right now, there is a lady on Wagner Lane, Miss Leah Patney, she's one hundred and seven years of age. She has a good memory, she remember all who there were some Courtney's on Wagner Lane, by the way. <laughs> if you talk to Mr. Derek, he, he could um, give you the information. But here is a person with information, I'm sure. And so no call no name, but Nitch could find time to sit and talk with that lady. But Lata I think that the broader conversation, and, and I guess I hear what you're saying in terms of university lectures and in having down, man. community, community like yeah. forums. But beyond that, it's Knowing and understanding our history is a part of what makes us who we are. Um, and it, it seems like a lot of this information, if you don't go out and seek it, if it isn't transmitted through a medium like this, 
would know would be nowhere in the consciousness of people who grow up in Belize. Yeah. And what difference do you think it makes on the type of society that we are today because we don't have a foundation in this type of knowledge? I don't have to fall back upon the kind of phrase that Komoto Marcos Garvey and, and those people who have all their lives they have spent with these issues and say that uh, and say to the Creoles and Southside in particular that when you don't know your history, when you don't know history, when you are cut off from your traditions and your culture, you see how the Garfuna is so strong? They are strong because of their culture. The Creoles, eh, except for maybe Konkas and it's Tunkush and identity. one or two words, we name, have, we, na we name Gafu, we, well, we couldn't have a language because then we come from different tribes so we were not all speaking the same thing. But massive respect to the Garinago people that they have held on in the face of racism and prejudice. So, to answer your question, if you are a people without your history, you are like a tree when you have no roots. You're going to dry up and die and blow away. What you see happening on the south side, there is no leadership, there is no um, there is no what uh, you know, there is no role models for us, there is nobody, not the bada. Any time we make any money, we look for abundance outside and get out of that. So, then get a raw deal because the Mennonites come and they are self-sufficient and independent and they work with each other. The Chinese do it. The new arrivals in terms of the Indians and all the peoples. We just debuck that it like, I don't know, man. Do you think that as we move forward, perhaps if we embrace just the Emancipation Day celebration itself and use that as an opportunity to start to get some of the knowledge out as to our history with slavery, that it could be a way of us being able to expand this knowledge? Is it, I mean, I, I know that, and, and I have to say this, because I know I saw uh, Yasser uh, Musa and a group, they had an Emancipation Day celebration. Um, it was very small, but it seems to be a start. Is it something, maybe that can be a stepping stone for us to move in a direction where we can be honest with the history that we have? Well, you can't go wrong if you try to yeah. focus on an important part of your history. But we would also need to make the observation that after the first day of August in 1838, there was jubilation, there was celebration, there was like, what records exist in Mangana Governor House, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, make big speeches. The, the orators, or clearly they must have had orators. Your people would have come from a line of people who can have that gift to express themselves. And every year, the 1st of August was almost like a national holiday in Belize City. Slaves would not forget that. You would not forget that after that, then Kiala Shu. They adopted the slave laws in Belize, you know, the consolidated slave laws of Jamaica were said to be adopted in Belize, where a slave can be whipped 39 times, you know, commit no offense. The master could put her in a prison, as you said, Thomas Pastor, he took it from himself. He mutilated several of his slaves, mm -hmm. and it was so terrible in his time for his own white man and carry him a court, and he was found guilty of mutilation, mutilation, and just lashing, you know. <laughs> if you cut off your private, cut off your breast, slice your nose, do your bad thing, not bad thing that. In fact, you hear me getting all worked up. You know, Thomas Pastor may mess me up because one week on the Creme Carlin talk show on a Wednesday, I had said like, man, I can't believe we got Thomas Pastor name from a building like, <clears throat> the biggest beautiful building right in the middle of town. That, that time for that, no, you know, come to a young man can say, yeah, you the talk where I do. I say, buy it, me that don't burn down, you know. Bam, the thing and burn down within seven days. <laughs> well, if we flip it to the positive, I can say this much, that we, um, with much advocacy, managed to get the name changed um, without what we're seeing in the United States with the pulling down statues um, and, and, and having to fight for that type of removal um, of what some consider the scars of the we history. Had to burn down the so I know <laughs> the name change didn't happen after after it burned. It happened recently through advocacy. And let's hope that this conversation opens people's eyes as to how much we've not been exposed to, 
um, and, and push for more. I mean, I think there's also a, a key role in being able to amalgamate and at least show the parallels between what was happening with the Mayans um, as well as uh, what was happening in, in the areas where there were settlements from the British and slaves. So there's a lot more we could discuss. This was really just scraping the surface, and we appreciate you yeah, being here, Dickie, be, to do that. Yeah. Well, let me just end by saying that in answer to your okay. important observation, Belize did experience four well-recorded slave rebellions in mm -hmm. 1765 and 1768. The biggest one was 1773. And interestingly enough, there was one in 1820. Mm -hmm. All that talk about we, the paddling, and then white man go fight Spaniard and this, that, that, and so. 1820, then man gets up vex that they killed white people, burned down place, captured their camp, and so on. And we have the name out of the whole record in Belize, out of the 1820 slave rebellion came the name Will and Sharper. Two of the leaders, according to the masters, those two, there was a reward for them. You know, kind of like Western movie, dead or alive, we got mm -hmm. to get Will and we got to get Sharper. Mm -hmm. um, I had said one time some years ago that, man, we didn't got them man name, no way, and so on. And a man, a taxi man came and told me, no, Mr. Dickey, their name was Street, back of Belama, Will and Sharper Street. Okay. Mm -hmm. But I want to end by saying this too. Well, well a lot of things, but let me just yeah, say this quickly. The, one. <laughs> the mayor, by the way, we can't not talk about slavery and not make mention of the fact that there were rebellions. They called that, that Black mm -hmm. Lives Matter in that time. Mm -hmm. But also there were so many Igbos from Nigeria who were slaves that from Berkeley Street all the way down to the Yaba Cemetery, that whole area was Igbo town. For a very, very long time, the Igbos, they had long barracks there. It was burnt down and rebuilt. So I say that to end on this note, that, well, I have to call name. Mayor Bernard has asked a group of persons to come up with some ideas as to how they could revive something about Igbo town. Mm. That full full statue where they there with Isaiah Martha that would have to be changed. The man looked like a monkey, we can't allow that. That somebody should tear that down. So we need a sensible because this is a Belizean millionaire, this is a black man in Oki Oak he owns so he, he deserves a better statue than the yes, one. Yes ma'am I'm multi millionaire they sell yeah. coconut. So there is some little work afoot in terms of trying to remember what is going on. But um, let us let us make the point that it is shameful that the first of August came and went why? <laughs> Weird. All right. But thanks for having me. But we had this conversation today to at least remind us. Okay. I'm sure we'll have you back next year again. We don't know if it'll be virtual or in person or what's going to happen then. Um, by then, you'll catch up with the technology? No, um, <laughs> We'll leave it at that. <laughs> we'll take that break. When we come back, we're going to be talking uh, to a book author. So please stay tuned.